Good morning. Welcome to the New America Foundation. Uh, for the folks who are here, the folks who are watching it on our live stream, and the uh, folks on C-SPAN 2, uh, welcome to the uh, uh, first event of the political reform program uh, at New America. I'm Mark Schmidt. I uh, recently returned to New America to, uh, to get this program launched. It's, uh, it's not the first uh, event or discussion we've had about uh, political reform issues uh, here, but it is the first in this uh, in this series, and, I, and there'll be many more, which I hope you will uh, you'll you'll uh, you'll come to. Um, today, uh, we wanted uh, we're, we're bringing people together to discuss a, a fabulous new book called "Subsidizing Democracy" by Michael G. Miller, who's a professor at the University of Illinois Springfield. And um, uh, what we're trying to the the value of this book is that it's really the first book to look at. Uh, what's really happening in some of the states, particularly Arizona, that have had uh, robust public financing systems for some years now. At the, at the national level, the conversation about money and politics has mostly been a conversation of despair. The numbers are huge, outside money overwhelms the candidates and parties, the courts are unfriendly, nothing seems to be happening in Congress, even on things like disclosure that we once thought there was a lot of consensus around. But in fact, over the last uh, 15 years or so, we've had a significant amount of experimentation, uh, mostly in the states, some localities, with systems of public financing that vary in, in significant ways. Um, and given that experimentation, we're able to really look, begin to look at what works and what doesn't. Most of these systems, and this includes Arizona, Connecticut system of public financing, Maine, New York City's uh, small donor matching system, Minnesota's tax credit system, which was turned off for a while and then turned on, which creates an interesting uh, little experiment in what happens. Most of these systems have been generally upheld by the courts, with one uh, significant exception in Arizona and part of the Arizona law. They've been generally politically resilient, that is, they've withstood efforts to repeal them, uh, and they've been generally popular with candidates. Um, when I first got involved in, in some of these issues around the time that our, the Arizona law was, was beginning to bubble up, I was working on the Hill, and we tended to look at public financing as almost like a, you know, just like a black and white thing. If more public money would be good, let more, less private money would be bad, you'd automatically have less corruption, uh, fairer elections, things like that. Um, over time, you realize like a lot of things will happen in a system like that, and there's a lot that happens between the financing and the election and the legislation. And what Michael's book does is begin to look at what goes on in the, in, the, in the middle? What do different kind of candidates participate? Does voter participation increase or, or, or change in any significant way? Um, is the ideology of people who participate or don't participate any different? Or an, an interesting significant question that this book digs into is, do people, do, have we created opportunities for people to game the system or manipulate it in, in ways to their, to their advantage? So I'm enthusiastic about Michael uh, launching some of that discussion. And then after he uh, presents some important findings from the book, uh, which, which really involved an in-depth study of, of candidates in Arizona as well as, uh, as, well as all the other uh, systems, we'll have comments on it from, uh, from three people who actually have uh, diff surprisingly different perspectives on this, although they share a basic sympathy to the idea. Michael Malbin is, well, actually, we'll start. Spencer Overton is a professor of law at George Washington University School of Law here. Um, uh, from 2008 to 2010, he, or 2000, well, he'll, he'll say the dates, I think 2009 to 2011, he was a principal deputy attorney general working on voting rights in the Office of, of Legal Policy. Uh, he's the author of, a, of an article called The Participation Interest, which is one of my uh, one of the articles that's really most influenced my view of money and politics. Uh, Michael Malbin is the director of the Campaign Finance Institute um, and a professor at, the, uh, at, at SUNY Albany, State University of New York at Albany, and a longtime uh, observer of all these reform uh, uh, traditions. He's the author, co-author of a wonderful paper called Reform in the Age of Network Campaigns, which, like the participation interest, uh, kind of helped us think about some of these, some of these ideas in a new way. And finally, uh, Matt Hines on the right, Dr. Matt Hines is a, is a medical doctor. He is a former, he, more importantly for our purposes, uh, he is a two-term Arizona state representative, uh, was minority whip in the Arizona legislature, and we'll talk about really the experience of, of being a participant in this system and also running in an election where he didn't have the public financing as a candidate for a, an unsuccessful candidate for Congress in, in 2012. Um, 
He's currently a director of provider outreach at the Department of Health and Human Services. And of course, he is not speaking on behalf of, uh, <laughs> of the administration, <laughs> but really from his own personal experiences. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to, to Michael Miller. Uh, thanks, Mark. And I just want to uh, say thanks to the New America Foundation and the other panelists for, for joining us uh, today. Um, Mark's introduction was so good, I, I, I cut my, my presentation, I think, in half. But <laughs> um, my orientation, my, my, the, the reason why I came to, to really be interested in this as policy and want to write the book from the perspective that I did is uh, in a former life, I, I was a, a consultant and strategist working on congressional campaigns and doing you know, strategy and, and management. And we didn't always win. And when we would lose, the candidates would always say the same thing. You know, imagine if we, what we could have done if only we'd had the money. right? Um, and that stayed with me. When I went to graduate school and progressed through uh, that, that part of my life, and you, you come to need to take on the big question, and, and that's a pretty big question. What would candidates do if, if they had more money? But to me, the, the jumping off point is really the understanding that these programs, more than just you know, from the big questions that, that we tend to think of them as, you know, the, the, winning, the winning and the losing, the differential between incumbents and challengers, uh, there's a real capacity here to change candidate behavior, change the way that they interact with the voters, and then by extension, change the way that people in these systems, even if they don't know that publicly funded elections are a thing where they live, uh, the, the orientation and participation of voters, uh, I think, there's a great potential for it to be, to be affected by uh, the presence of public funding. Um, so, you know, the goal of the book really is to expand the analysis. We have political science had, had really looked at these kind of easy to measure questions. Are elections closer? Are incumbents winning? Do challengers have more money when they run? But I wanted to get uh, a little bit more in depth uh, in the analysis and to focus on the, the candidates. So the book really looks at public funding through their eyes. And the way that I did that is I went to Arizona uh, shortly following the 2006 legislative elections in January 2007. And I did uh, on ground interviews with candidates of all types, sitting legislators, uh, primary losers across the state. And then fielded a survey during the 2008 legislative elections to candidates in 18 states. So importantly, this is not just Arizona. Uh, there are uh, public funding systems of some stripe in place in almost half the states today, if you take a very broad definition of public funding. So importantly, you know, for the audience, I'm going to focus uh, not on you know, the matching funds programs. I know the panelists have done a lot of work there. I'm not going to talk about those, but I hope they will. Uh, I'm going to speak only about the subsidy programs that take a dollar from a, some account of the government and move it directly to a candidate's pocket. So importantly, there are to me two types of that program, what I'm calling in the book partial and full, and they're pretty self-explanatory. In the fully funded systems uh, that in 2008 when I did the study, uh, those were in place in Arizona, Connecticut, and Maine. And the programs effectively give candidates all of the money that they need to run a race. So for example, in Arizona, uh, when Dr. Hines ran, I believe the subsidy was just over $30,000 for the primary and general election. And uh, when a candidate runs in that circumstance, you agree you're not going to raise any additional money beyond that. You're not going to spend beyond that spending cap. And you're not going to put any of your own money additionally in. So you're locking out all private donors. And the, the viability threshold for a candidate for the Arizona House is 210 five dollar donations. So once they can get 210 people to give them exactly five dollars, that's how they qualify for the subsidy. The partial programs in 2008 uh, were in play in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Hawaii. Wisconsin has since suspended its program, but those programs only give you a, a, a percentage of the money that you need. To run, to run the race. So there might be a $30,000 spending limit, but we'll give you $10,000 to get you started and you have to raise the rest. Well, thinking about candidate behavior, to me, that's a really important distinction because the fully funded programs effectively eliminate the necessity of raising money. 
And having worked in campaign offices and seen the effort the candidates have to expend to raise the, the amounts of money that they need, I thought it, you know, the, the real element here that's important is not money, it's time. So the question is, if you remove that fundraising uh, item from the menu of activities that candidates have to do on a week-to-week -week basis, what will they do with that time that they regain? And so that's a, a really important uh, question for understanding the way that politics uh, will be waged. So I did a survey where I asked candidates what they did, and I went and talked to them and asked them what they did. And I'll, I'm going to go through the findings of how uh, accepting full and partial funding um, affected their time. So on a week-to-week -week basis, when we control for all the other things that could also affect this relationship, candidates in fully funded states but not partially funded states uh, demonstrated significantly less time uh, spent fundraising, about five hours per week. Okay? And it effectively goes from five hours to zero hours because they don't have to raise any money. The partially funded candidates, because they only got some of the money that they needed, still raise, they still behave exactly like traditionally funded candidates. They're spending five to seven hours per week fundraising. So from that, if uh, you have one group of candidates, the fully funded candidates, not raising money, what do they do with the time? They invest it 100% and then some back into what I call public interaction. Now that's broadly defined and it's you know, an effort to get a vote. We in political science uh, have conceived, uh, Paul Hernson's work has conceived of um, politics as kind of existing in two spheres. You have the campaign for money and the campaign for votes. So I'm looking at, at public interaction and anything a candidate does to chase a vote, be it uh, electronic campaigning, uh, field canvassing, posting signs, meeting with interest groups, doing press interviews, etc. So if you take various definitions of public interaction, I get the same result, and that is about 12 percentage points of weekly time uh, is fed back into interacting on a personal level uh, with voters. When you translate that into weekly hours, it's five to six hours a week that fully funded candidates are spending talking with voters that they wouldn't have otherwise. Um, and over the course, that, that sounds like a kind of a small number to a lot of people, but when you think about the typical legislative campaign in America existing from March to November, and then five hours per week over that period of time, what we're talking about here is hundreds, certainly, and probably thousands of interactions between candidates and voters that would not have occurred otherwise. Okay, so the second question, you know, if, if candidates are talking to voters, you, you know, theoretically you think, well, a couple of things might happen. If I have a candidate on my doorstep, um, I'm receiving as a voter information about that race. Maybe I had no idea who was running for the state house. I'm also raising salience about the race. Maybe I didn't know what the county auditor or the state uh, legislative candidate, the state house does. Uh, so, so there's learning uh, happening. And while I can't suss out the mechanism there, um, you would think theoretically that if there's more interaction between a candidate and a voter, there's probably going to be changes in voting behavior. So when we look at voting, uh, we find some interesting effects as well. But what you have to do, I think, when you study public funding, particularly in state legislative elections, is throw out the tendency to look at turnout. Because I don't think, theoretically, that these things in state races are powerful enough to compel someone to get off their couch and drive to the polling place. Uh, because you know, if you think about all of you as voters, when was the last time you went, you know, in a presidential election especially, when was the last time you went charged up to vote for the state legislative candidate? Uh, we, don't, we don't see that. So I think the correct uh, dependent variable is roll-off. So the question here is, what's the percentage of people who show up, vote for the president, and then stop voting, right? So they, they cast a vote up here on the ballot, but then, don't vote, then, but then don't cast a ballot for the races down below. And we see that uh, in really high visibility presidential years, like 2008, when you had a lot of turnout coming in. People are, are knowledgeable about the, the presidential race, but not the races down below. Well, when they have a candidate on their doorstep, I find 2008 uh, in Connecticut and 2000 in, in, Air, or in Maine, excuse me, when there's a publicly funded candidate running in their district, a roll-off goes down by 20 to 30 percent. 20 to 30 percent, excuse me. So another way to interpret that is of the people who went to vote in the presidential election years, about 30% more of them are voting when a publicly funded candidate runs. So summing up, 
Uh, the, the fully funded candidates are spending much more time direct, directly interacting with the voting public. And in districts where at least one of those candidates is running, more people are registering a preference and voting in those races. Again, not turnout. Okay, the people who have already gone to vote are, are voting on more of their, their ballot. We're losing few, fewer of them. So there's more of this kind of interaction happening that many Americans, I think, see as a, as a cornerstone of representative democracy, and more people are voting. So those are fairly good in a normative sense things, I think, for most people. Um, I also looked at what we call candidate quality, which is exactly what it sounds like. How good are these candidates? Um, for most of America, when you have privately funded races, uh, raising money is a really hard and awful thing to do. And if you're not a good candidate, if you don't have those attributes, maybe you haven't served in a lower, you've never been elected to an office before, you don't have the connections, uh, what we see is the familiar story that Mark kind of alluded to in the introduction is can challenging candidates become buried by incumbents who have all the, all the advantages and resources. What I find in public funding is uh, that you, these programs are effectively a, a factory for quality candidates because you know, if you think about the social studies teacher who always wanted to run for the state house but has never gone to party meetings, has never really made those funding connections. The marketplace in most of America might judge her as you know, not a great candidate. Why should I invest in a candidate who doesn't have any experience? I can take my campaign, do my donation, and give it to somebody who I think is going to win. What we find here with the publicly funded, with the full funding especially, is we diminish anxiety among candidates. We increase the feelings that, they, uh, that they're feeling in control. They are less surprised about the rigors of raising money. And uh, they emerge to take on safe incumbents. So you're seeing challengers coming out of the woodwork and saying things like, yeah, I knew I was going to lose this race, but this program gave me all the resources I needed to run a strong campaign, and I wanted to give my neighbors the conversation. That's what this is all about. So it's, it's completely altered strategic uh, framework. And, uh, that, that, that's kind of interesting to me. So the, the quality factory really changes the capacity of citizens to transition to candidates um, and, and in a strong way. So I'm happy to talk about that a little bit more in questions. So those are all, I, I think, fairly normatively good things. But it's not all good news okay, from the states. Um, I, I have a chapter in the book in which I talk about what I call partisan costs of participating. And uh, the Republican candidates or conservative candidates, I'll use the terms interchangeably, but even if they're not always exactly the same thing, they report more political costs of participation, higher anxiety, uh, more strategic concerns, because sometimes if you run as a publicly funded Republican in a primary, your opponent will use that against you and say you're taking taxpayer money. Uh, to run for campaigns. So what you see because of that cost dynamic is a much higher participation rate among Democrats. And if you look at how that plays out for incumbents of the legislature in the publicly funded states, uh, Democrats are less likely to be met with a publicly funded challenge and therefore with a candidate who's got sufficient resources to, make, to mount a good challenge. So there is some concern in my mind that uh, one of the practical results of these programs is to lead to uh, Republican incumbents being a little more threatened than Democratic incumbents. Another uh, finding that, that would not be as positive on public funding is I find a pervasive gaming of the matching funds systems as originally constructed. Now those have since been struck down uh, by the United States Supreme Court in the Free Enterprise case. But uh, candidates in the matching fund system, the way it, it was originally worked was, if I ran as a publicly funded candidate against a traditionally funded one, um, every dollar my opponent spent above the threshold, I would get a check. We are locked in financial parity up till $100,000 or so. Uh, so what the traditionally funded candidates did in that circumstance is they would not spend money above the threshold and wait until the weekend before the election. So they'd make a bunch of contracts and and wait until the Friday before the election, and then all of a sudden they're up on TV with ads and mailers and walkers, and, and so it was like a, a pop-up campaign, right? Um, and so the, the publicly funded candidates in that situation would get the checks on Tuesday or Wednesday after the election. And so we, we found uh, that it was really delaying the spending and pushing back political activity as well. So 
that's kind of the quick uh, tour of the book, and I would be happy to take questions later and I wait. Uh, comments, but I would just say in closing that you know the lesson here from a policy perspective is that you know we tend to approach these things with these uh, conclusions or, or assumptions about American policy or politics and, and democracy, and I, I really think as we move forward and consider the, uh, the particularly the proposed uh, public funding bill for Congress, we ought really think about how the incentives are going to change and how the activities and behavior and strategy and emotions of, of congressional candidates or any candidates would change and in turn how that altered behavior would affect uh, voters as well. So I would uh, turn it back over. Thank you very much Michael. I think we're going to go Michael Malbin and then okay. Spencer. Oh. <laughs> So I want to add my thanks to, uh, to Mark and to the New America Foundation for putting on this event. And I want to begin with um, my most important comment, and that's this. This is a good book. Um, it's a very good book. So anyone who's here who bothered to come out this morning to hear this event, um, you should buy it. It's available outside afterwards, and he'll sign it. So that's my big, my big point. I wanted to say this up front um, because most of my comments today are going to sound critical. And that's because I'm going to take what I've learned from the book and try to apply it to different situations. I'm doing this because I think public financing is important as an issue. And also because no jurisdiction in the future is likely to pass a program that's exactly like the ones in Arizona, Maine, and Connecticut. It's important to remember, yes, the Supreme Court did overturn Arizona's trigger funds, and by implication also Maine's and Connecticut's. That's the money that Michael described that gave extra, extra money to candidates who were facing high spending opponents or independent expenditures. But at the same time, the Supreme Court firmly and clearly upheld the constitutionality of voluntary public financing. Now, the key word there is voluntary. No legislature, candidates who, who sign up for public funding have to do it voluntarily. And no legislature in the future is likely to adopt a program with rigid spending limits that leaves a candidate helpless against millionaire opponents and independent spending. So as a result, advocates now are typically recommending different policies. In New York State and in all of the federal bills under serious consideration, the sponsors have moved away from full public funding with spending limits, and instead they use public financing as a floor, and then they use matching funds to give candidates an incentive to raise money from small donors. So when I read the book, I'm not looking for just for a static analysis of one system. I'm looking at the reasoning underneath. I'm looking at lessons for the future. Um, for example, for the reasoning underneath, uh, th I, am, I was extremely impressed by the way Michael decided to work his way through the way laws structure incentives for candidates. Uh, that's not the way most political scientists have written about the subject in the past. I think it's the right way to go about it. Um, but to explain uh, what I've learned, I'm going to spend most of my time in only one of the book's chapters. I'll be happy to, in Q&A to talk about any of the others, including this excellent chapter on voter engagement and participation that Michael summarized. But for now, for, for now I want to focus on this issue of how candidates spend their time as a way to get at the question that concerns me. That chapter begins by saying that most candidates have too much to do and they don't have enough time to do it, and that's clearly correct. So the, the question of the book is, so what happens if you can free them up from fundraising, which is an activity most candidates do not enjoy? And to answer this, as Michael said, he, uh, he asked the candidates to f in a number of states to fill out a time log in early October, and from those logs, he found that candidates who accept full public funding spend no time raising money and therefore spend a greater percentage of their time 
making direct contact with voters than did the traditionally funded candidates in the same states. Now, that's not a surprise, but it's important because most of us would prefer that candidates take time to communicate with constituents. Then the book went on to compare states with each other. And it found that candidates in full public funding states, as Michael said, spend a higher percentage of their time in voter, direct voter contact than candidates in, in states with no public funding or in partial public funding. And importantly for future policy, he found almost no difference between states with partial public funding and no public funding. And that's where I want to focus my attention because I have serious reservations about the conclusion and about the method. So to explain the reservation, I'm, I'm afraid I have to get into some weeds. Um, to make sure he had enough cases to test statistical significance, what Michael did, what he decided to do, and I understand why, is he decided he lumped together all of the um, full public funding states and the partial states and the what he calls the traditional funded states and he analyzed them as, as groups. He, he pulled the data, he joined them up, and he, that was the basis for the findings about full versus partial versus none. Now to get a little more deeply into the weeds, um, if you look at the data before they were pulled, and if you already have the book, it's uh, figure 3.1 on page 55, Michael gives us a bar chart which shows the results of each state individually. When you look at the bars carefully, you see that the results are not quite so neat as the conclusion I just presented. For example, publicly funded candidates in Arizona spend less time on field activities than the ones in Maine's or Connecticut, the two other full public funding state, states. That's not a problem by itself. But it becomes a problem when you compare Arizona to the states that do not have clean elections. First, let's compare Arizona to the three states with partial funding. All three of those states in the sample with partial funding, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Hawaii, candidates spent a higher, not a lower percentage, on direct voter contact uh, than the fully funded candidates in Arizona. Now, yes, if, uh, the, uh, if you quite count everything as campaign activity, then if you don't do fundraising, then you spend 100% of their time on, on the other stuff. But Michael did emphasize direct voter contact. Um, now even more, more surprisingly, that fact was also true in six of the nine states with no public money. Um, six of the nine, the candidates spent more time on direct voter contact and percentage of time than in Arizona. Only three states out of a dozen came in lower than Arizona. So my conclusion from all this is that something more is, is because I don't dispute what happens when you group the three together that on average the three public funding states look, look the way they did. But my conclusion is that something more is going on than the difference between full public funding, partial, and traditional. Publicly funded candidates in Maine had the highest percentage of voter contact time, but traditionally funded candidates in Maine were second. The variation among states is just is far too wide for the book's explanation to be enough or satisfactory. The use of multiple regression analysis really doesn't help us to solve the problem because the data were pooled before the regression. So I, I took the time to go through these weeds because it's not just a technical issue. It has important policy implications. We have to figure out exactly what's driving these differences if you want to know the real impact of public financing or contribution limits or campaign or any other kind of campaign finance regulation. And this is going to be especially important for the future because future public funding will be partial. It turns out that the differences among the state's programs are far more nuanced than the big labels suggest. For example, let's, if we look at the states with partial public funding, Minnesota is quite different from Hawaii or Wisconsin. In both Hawaii and Wisconsin, very little public money goes to candidates, the spending limits are unrealistically low, and few candidates choose to participate. In Minnesota, a much higher percentage of the money is public. Small contributions are supported by tax credits, and these in turn can be seen as publicly supported money. And a majority of Republican and Democratic candidates do participate. 
Partly as a result of these policies, Minnesota's candidates receive a higher percentage of their money from small donors than in any other state in the country, 57% in 2010, which is the most recent year for which we have data. You also see striking results with New York City's six to one small donor matching fund system. In the recent 2013 elections, participating city council candidates got more than 60% of their money from small donors or from the matching funds that small donors um, generate. In contrast, the median state in 2010 received only 14% of their money um, from small donors. No other state was close to Minnesota or New York, New York City. So why did this happen? Maybe it's because the rules in both Minnesota and New York drive the candidates to steer their fundraising toward um, low dollar donors within the candidate's district. As a result, campaigning and fundraising in those places, not in most places, but in those places, they're of a piece. Um, they're interwoven rather than being separate activities. When a candidate can make a pitch to potential donors about a rebate or matching funds, those pitches are taking place in a local living room or in a meeting hall, not in corporate boardrooms and not in downtown law firms. In this respect, small donor matching fund programs are different from others. In traditional fundraising, fundraising is separate from campaigning. In clean election states, there is no fundraising. In Minnesota and New York City, the two become intertwined. This is not like other public funding, whether partial or full. It has a different dynamic. It has to be understood as such. So my big takeaway in these comments is this. We have to understand that the impact of programs vary quite a bit with the details. The details are not only about public funding, but also about contribution limits and disclosure. Michael's book has added to what we know. It is a definite contribution. It has shown, for example, that publicly funded candidates in Arizona, Connecticut, and Maine spend more of their time on direct voter contact than traditionally funded candidates in the same state. But it doesn't tell us as much as we need to know to, to differentiate among other states. With respect to public funds, Minnesota's and New York's models have been very successful, and they're being looked at by other jurisdictions as models. Because of this, we need to look at them more carefully. So, in the spirit of a typical researcher, my bottom line is I like Michael's book, but there is much more to do, and comparative state research is what is most deeply needed because it's only by comparing states that you can get at what makes for effective and ineffective programs. Thank you very much, Michael. I'm just gonna make one quick comment on what you, what you just said reminded me of something, something that stuck in my head since I heard uh, Janet Napolitano several years ago when she was still governor of Arizona speaking about the state system. And she, they put a lot of value in, the, in those qualifying contributions. And she, I remember her saying, the, thing, the great thing for me is I used to go, when she ran for attorney general, she said I used to go to, the, to law firm boardrooms to raise money. And then I would go out to you know, the reservations and other places to look for votes. And now I can go to the same people I'm looking for for votes for money, and it's, you know, that, that's a good standard to, uh, to look at. Spencer. Thanks. So I would like to thank Mark Schmidt. Thanks so much for the opportunity to come out today. Uh, Professor Miller has written uh, a very important book. I agree with Michael about that. Now, I'm a law professor, not a political scientist, and you know, lawyers, including U.S. Supreme Court justices, we often make unfounded assumptions about how politics works, right? Uh, but, but, but the facts, the facts are important. Uh, and that's something that's important about this book. You know, we would assume that public financing requires that candidates spend less time fundraising. We might assume that Republican candidates might be more averse to accepting public money. But this book shows it. There's facts there. Many of us have faced the question of uh, whether or not public financing increases turnout. Professor Miller makes the more penetrating observation that with public financing, 
voters are more likely to vote in down ballot races, important contributions. I also like the fact that Professor Miller focuses on state reform. Uh, too often, especially those of us who are in the Washington, D.C. area, right, just focus too much on federal reform. And they're, they're cutting edge organizations like public campaign, like Demos, like Common Cause, that focus on state reforms in addition to federal reforms. And, and that state action is, is, is quite important. Uh, so now, as, as a good objective political scientist, Professor Miller focuses deeply on data, as I've said. He acknowledges that the goals of different public financing programs vary. Now, because I'm a lawyer, I can't really speak about, about data or, or facts, right? So I want to talk about my opinions. I'm going to dress them up and call them values, <laughs> right? But I, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to focus on, on these values uh, uh, here. Um, public financing should no longer aim to purge all money from politics. That's kind of my value proposition statement. Instead, it should encourage as many private citizens from varied economic backgrounds to participate in the financing of politics. Uh, conventional reformers suggest that uh, there's too much money in politics, but they're wrong. Real problem is that money comes from too few people. While 64% of eligible Americans voted, in the November 2008 election. Only 10% typically give to political campaigns. And less than one half of 1% is responsible for the bulk of money that we see in campaigns. So just like we encourage all citizens to vote, a key goal of public financing should be to encourage all citizens to participate, to make a financial contribution to a political candidate of his or her choice. Unfortunately, conventional campaign reform, public financing, sometimes suppresses political participation. Had Barack Obama, for example, participated in general public financing, you know, his campaign would not have been able to collect for the general election even a single $5 contribution from a contributor, right? He would not have attracted an unprecedented number, millions of small donors. And perhaps more important, President Obama would have, have likely sacrificed thousands of volunteer organizers who engaged in voter registration, door-to-door -door canvassing, and phone banking. That's because as Michael Malbin has shown in his work, that uh, you know, donating even small amounts creates a bond to a movement, and that leads to other forms of grassroots engagement in terms of volunteering, voting, et cetera. One of the most promising tools for expanding participation is using public funds to match political contributions. That was mentioned a little bit before, but the idea in a nutshell uh, is that public financing programs should no longer attempt to equalize money between candidates by giving each candidate the same amount or a flat grant. Instead, public financing should facilitate participation by donors uh, by giving a six to one match on the first $200 of a contribution. So for example, that makes a $200 contribution by an individual worth $1,400 to a candidate. Now multiple matching funds, it, it reflects a, a philosophical shift about the role of money in politics. As David Donnelly has written, reformers need to spend less energy on getting big money out of campaigns and more on getting the people back into those very same campaigns. Uh, multiple matching funds address the core challenge to political participation, that's lack of income. Income is a barrier to participation. Uh, for example, in 2004, individuals with family incomes over $100,000, you know, they represented only 11% of the population, 
uh, they made up a slightly higher percentage, percentage 15% of those who voted, right? Uh, and in terms of the amount of money that they gave, uh, they, they gave uh, well over 70% of the money uh, that was used for campaigns. So uh, average folks are not participating, and we want average folks to participate in campaigns. Multiple matching funds make uh, candidates more willing to engage more Americans and expand participation. Uh, for example, uh, another study from Michael Melvin. I've got a, I'm a law professor, if I didn't mention it. You know, uh, I'm not a political scientist like Michael, so I've got to use his, his, his numbers, right? Uh, in New York State, candidates collect only 7% of their money from contributors who give seven uh, 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 who give $250 or less. So that's for state candidates, right? New York State. There's no match in New York State in the state. But on the city level, New York City, where there is a match, these candidates, as Michael has talked about, collect over 60% of their money from people who give $250 or less. Right? And that's because candidates target these higher income Americans because it's just easier to raise money, right? Candidate says, why should I call for, why should I call 10 people and ask for $100 for each of them when I can make one call and, and get $1,000, right? And studies show that people who are asked are more likely to give. So we shouldn't be surprised that since uh, higher income people are more likely to be asked by candidates, they're more likely to give. Now let me turn away from the differences in terms of public financing uh, here and there to critics of public financing, right? Some critics argue, hey, private markets alone should finance politics. I disagree with that. I disagree because providing the basic framework for citizen participation, that's a proper function of government. So for example, the state provides a platform for people to participate through voter registration services, through accessible polling places, through ballots, through other tools. Multiple matching funds are no different. Multiple matching funds, they're not welfare for politicians, if, as some have uh, labeled conventional public financing. Instead, multiple matching funds, they allow more people to use money as a tool to hold uh, public officials accountable. Those who insist that we have to rely on private money alone to finance politics, they elevate their mechanical aversion to government over uh, a, a commitment to legitimately expand liberty to more people. Uh, these multiple matching funds, they make candidates less dependent on a small group of large donors, and by doing so, they prevent corruption and the appearance of corruption. Uh, they can also avoid significant problems with traditional public financing, including wasting large subsidies on candidates with little public support. So summing it up, reformers, and they're already starting to do this, should stop trying to purge money from politics and instead should m use money as a tool to facilitate widespread participation in politics. Thank you. Thank you, Spencer. Dr. Neither a law professor nor a political scientist. No, uh, yeah, I, I am, I, again, here on behalf of myself as a former candidate, thank you to the New America Foundation, Mark Schmidt, for the, uh, for the invitation. Um, I, am, I am a former candidate and a former legislator from Arizona, and so I represent, I guess, a single data point. Um, so, uh, and I will disclose that I have not yet read the book, though I plan to. So I am just uh, giving you a little bit of an example of, of uh, what it's like to live through this type of a system and uh, my experiences with that and I'll compare it a little bit to running for Congress which was in terms of fundraising just awful 
um, as every candidate will tell you. So um, I, I, out of residency, I moved to Tucson, uh, Arizona to attend my internal medicine uh, residency program, <coughs> excuse me, there. And throughout my medical career became somewhat frustrated with in general, how we, how we dealt with patients, the inefficiencies in medicine and, and various other things that prompted me as I was exiting my residency to, um, to try to make a change. And not really knowing much at all about politics, uh, we'd had Representative Jim Colby, who was in uh, what is now Congressional District 2 in Southeast Arizona, uh, retire, and that caused quite a cascade, including state senator, then state senator Gabrielle Giffords, uh, who uh, stepped down from her Senate post, caused a, a variety of cascades, and um, freed up a state house seat. So I actually, I literally walked into the Democratic Party headquarters, uh, not knowing a thing, and announced, hello, I'm Matt Hines, and I'm here to run for Congress. And they just looked at me and said, who are you and why are you here? And I was in scrubs, I hadn't shaved even more so than now. And it was, that was my first real interaction with, with this whole system that I didn't understand in any way. Now eventually, uh, I was able to get some guidance from a, a state senator who's a dear friend of mine who sat down with me and just discussed how this works and he suggested, if you want to do this, by the way, being a Democrat in the state legislature in Arizona is not, necessarily a very rewarding experience um, only because of the fact that it's, I don't think it's two to one now, but for at least two of the years I served there, it was literally two to, more than two to one um, uh, majority Republican. So he just explained, you tend to lose every vote and um, you know, but we, we, we do work real hard, but um, you need to make sure this is gonna work with your career, family, and you need some money to do this. I recommend you look at the clean election system. And of course I had no idea what that was. And um, as you've heard described by Michael, uh, it, it, worked, it works really, really well. Uh, you, you get five bucks from, you wanna get about 250 of the contributions to make sure you have enough valid ones. And you do it going door to door. And that is something that, um, that was really, for me, very personally rewarding. And I can tell you that that it was basically all that I did was voter, <clears throat> excuse me, was voter contact. I went door to door and and you know, as a newly minted doctor going door to door asking for five dollars, a little odd, but, um, but I got to teach people about what this program was, what it did, how it empowered them, and how it got uh, some of the excess money out of the system. And I, I got you know, 250 contributions going door to door and then continued that. My volunteers, myself, I think I went to about five, over 5,000 homes personally. That's hard to do, and I did that in about seven months, and I literally spoke to over 2,000 people on their doorsteps. And that is the kind of, and I really, that, that's the most rewarding thing that I think that, that I was able to do during the campaign, and that's how I actually did defeat an incumbent. Um, to, the way the House elections work, they're two, the two top vote-getters in the primary uh, are the ones that go on to the general. In my district, which was majority and minority, Democrats typically win. Uh, but um, a, an incumbent that had been there for oh, three terms, who was very comfortable and did not choose to do much in the way of field work, not in much in the way of going door to door, who also didn't qualify for his clean elections contributions either, uh, was defeated by two clean election candidates, myself included. So it, it definitely worked, and it certainly, in this case, was able to help a candidate like me with absolutely no connection whatsoever to a network, to politics. Uh, as a resident, you're kind of an indentured servant. You are in the hospital, uh, and in this case, the VA, also a couple of other hospitals in, in Arizona there, and um, you don't really come out to see the light very often. <laughs> so um, but it, was, it was something that was able to, to help me um, get into the system, and I did not win in 2006, actually. I kind of skipped over that. I, I tried, and I did well, but then I ran again, also as a clean candidate in 2008, and I did win. And that was the election I was talking about where I defeated uh, an incumbent. So uh, 
really, I have to say my experience has been a very positive one with the system. I chose to run in 2010 using more traditional funding at that point uh, for a variety of reasons. And, uh, but I did, that wasn't, it still wasn't a huge focus for me because I was a, an unchallenged incumbent. But then moving to, um, moving to 2012, where um, I briefly was in a Democratic congressional primary against my friend Ron Barber, um, who wasn't initially going to run, by the way. So um, that was a very, very different experience, and one that um, maybe someday I'll repeat, but I, 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 I kind of doubt it. Um, and principally because the entire time I was in a windowless room on the phone trying to beat money out of people, and it was the most frustrating. I mean, I, I don't know how I didn't burn through more staff because it was very, very frustrating. And I don't think I knocked on a single door, not one. So I went from over 5,000 personal knocks on doors in 2008 to zero because I was in a room calling and asking for money to, to run this campaign. And that was, for me, that was really miserable because what I got from going door to door and talking to people face to face was a real idea about what they were facing in their world. I could see their house, I could see their kids, I could, um, I could, uh, I could assess all sorts of things. Uh, a lot of them asked me for medical advice, actually, <laughs> which, uh, which I, I gave with a caveat. So, um, <laughs> yeah, see your doctor, but you, yeah, it's definitely a problem. Um, so, you know, that is that is something I really missed, and that's something that I credit the clean election system in Arizona with, um, with really allowing me to do. And just to give you a bit of an idea how it works on the ground, because it's been there for so long, every, every election cycle, a very large recycled paper book comes out to all the voters, and everybody expects it now. It is the clean election candidate book, and you're listed in there, whether you're a clean elections candidate or not, um, you're, you're listed as traditional or clean, you can put in a paragraph about yourself, you get a picture, you can put your website and some other a phone number for your campaign. And that book has become kind of a mainstay of campaigning in, in Arizona. And people, people are expecting that and they get it every, I guess, every two years. So um, it's really been, and also there's a debate series as well. The clean election system in Arizona has the clean candidates uh, come together and have a, to do a forum. So that's kind of how the system works there. And uh, I don't want to take too much more of your time, but I do want to, again, thank, thank all of the panelists. And I look forward to, I believe there's going to be some time for questions. I look forward to answering any specific questions you might have of me. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Michael, do you want to say anything about respond to any of the comments, or do you want to just go to the... Yeah, okay. Um, I'm not, usually I have some things that I want to say, but I see so many people in the audience that I specifically want to hear what their questions are. So. Uh, we'll just do that. I, I will, one quick comment I want to make. I think sometimes we make a l when I hear, especially when I hear Matt talk about that role of the qualified, the, the, you know, the going door to door for the $5 contributions, we make a lot of the distinctions between these systems, but sometimes they look a little more like each other than we sometimes think. Um, and that importance of the qualifying contributions in Arizona has always struck me as a really, uh, a, 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 something that people I think didn't necessarily predict, um, but is very important. Let's um, go to the audience. Please say who you are. Where, you know, if you have an organizational affiliation, um, please say what it is. I'm going to go to the one person who I see who I know is from Arizona, Jonathan Rausch. Huh. <laughs> yeah, I, I was, I was going to brag about that. Uh, <laughs> born and raised, no kidding, Arizona, and though Phoenix, not Tucson. Um, a big rationale for these programs is, of course, to reduce the power of special interests and change the behavior of the way people actually vote after they're elected. Do you have any evidence on whether these clean money and matching arrangements change the behavior of politicians in office, especially vis-a-vis -vis interest groups? Uh, yes and no. On the question of, you know, is there a quid pro quo exchange you know, for campaign dollars and, and comparing legislative behavior within Arizona or any other of the fully funded states, I don't know that anyone has done that. Uh, but there are two studies, uh, one of which I've, I'm co-authoring with Seth Maskett, uh, where we find that legislators who are elected using public funding in both Arizona and Maine appear to be more ideologically extreme relative to their party caucuses. Um, so 
the, the, I've heard anecdotally candidates in Arizona say, uh, well, it's, it's much easier now if you eliminate the campaign finance marketplace because it used to be to get elected, you would have to be kind of moderate, right? You would have to go door to door and, or make the calls and, and no one would give you money if you were nuts. Uh, but now, uh, again, anecdotally, uh, what I hear is it's, it's very easy to get, you know, you can go if you're, for instance, just picking a side, if you're more conservative than the typical Arizona legislator, maybe you can go to your uh, church on Sunday and pass your pass the offering plate around with your $5 qualifying petition in it, and in one day you're qualified, right? There is none of that market vetting uh, going on. So that was kind of the theoretical reason for wanting to know that. But the evidence suggests, uh, the very preliminary unpublished evidence suggests that uh, the, on both sides, in both states that we've looked at, uh, clean funded legislators are to the right and left of their uh, respective caucuses. Um, but that's all I've got uh, you know, as, as far as meat of the, of the answer. And I think it's important to distinguish that system from, let's say, a multiple match system, yeah. right? So in other words, if you've got uh, 250 friends who are either in the Sierra Club or the NRA or whatever, you can get your you know, contributions together, your qualifying contributions together and get a big pot of money. In a place like New York City or other places, however, uh, you can continue to raise. You don't just stop at the 250 close ideological friends. You reach out to a broad group and you get more money as a result of reaching out to a greater number of people. So again, I'm not a fact guy, right, an empirical guy, but it is more likely that you'd have a broad spectrum of contributors. And Michael, I know you've done some work. Through yeah, that. Um, I want to respond both to John and to Michael. Um, with respect to um, policy, uh, it's very hard to do the research in a quantitative way, um, but uh, we know that the main documentable influence of large contributor networks on uh, office holders comes at the agenda state setting stage of the process, not on final roll call votes. That's why it's hard to do the research. Um, we have tons of exampled evidence of bills being specially kept off, not passed. It's, most, it's especially in a negative power of stopping a bill from moving forward, but also in amendments to create special breaks for people. Um, I don't think there's much doubt uh, that this happens. The question is, can you document that it doesn't happen in, other, you know, in, in a clean election state? Um, I haven't done that work, but I do know that a traditionally funded state, especially working through party leaders, agen the agenda setting stage <clears throat> is quite important. Um, second, on the question of uh, um, whether clean elections produces more extreme office holders. I don't want to get, again, this time I won't get in the weeds. We can have a private conversation later. I just want to say that I strongly disagree with the paper that is the unpublished article. Um, I have a different interpretation of their data. Um, and I find words like extremists to be tendentious, misleading. But it's the data that I think, I think that we will have this conversation. Um, when you move away from the clean election states, there, has been, there have been statements out there that systems that favor small donors are more polarizing and they'll have a more polarizing effect on politics. Campaign Finance Institute's research uh, says that that's not true. Uh, we've looked at whether small donors are more polarized than large donors and whether, and the answer is no, there's no evidence for it. Um, and we've looked at whether uh, the candidates who, to whom small donors give are more polarized than other candidates. And again, 
of, with one or two clear exceptions? The, re the answer is no. Uh, in terms of both candidates and in terms of and donors, there's really not much difference with the one difference that small donors don't lobby. And that is, that is a significant difference. So if I may just really quickly, it, this is again anecdotal, but I served with, however, I guess 89 legislators. And um, on one specific policy point uh, in 2012, I, may, I believe it was 2012, there was a significant reform proposed to the clean election system and um, with some provisions that would have entered, uh, caused some limitations um, to change it more a bit. I, I believe it was gonna make it more like, kind of like the New York system to a certain effect. And what you saw was some of the folks that I would, I would describe as perhaps ideologically non-viable without a public funding system. Um, they, it was very interesting to see the coalition of folks came, who came together to defend the existing clean election public funding system. And it, it did include uh, many uh, folks on both sides. Most, it was largely Democrats, but then it was a very interesting subsection of, um, of the majority caucus that relied entirely upon uh, the clean election system to, to get in there. So that's, again, anecdotal, but um, I, do, I do think it speaks to your point. Clean elections people more polarized or extreme than non-clean elections people? Um, in the case of those in the majority that I was observing to be part of that coalition to defend the existing system, I would say yes. In Arizona, again, in my experience. Of course, it, it's helpful to have bipartisan and cross-ideological support for a <laughs> Agreed. For a well. This is a really important question. I hope that after the paper with uh, Seth Maskett comes out, we can maybe get some get you know get this out because I think it's really it's a it's a it's a vitally important question. Meredith McGee. Hi, Meredith McGee with the Campaign Legal Center. Uh, one of the issues you guys have not addressed uh, yet is the role of parties, and I find this particularly interesting because when you talk to folks, particularly on the Republican side, many of their solutions to the current system, it deals with strengthening the parties. Uh, so one of the questions I have when you talk about looking at these matching systems, whether the Arizona is what you think the appropriate role of the party should be, one would say on one argument that they're a moderating influence. The other argument, my experience in Illinois, might be that the parties are a corrupting influence. So what role do you see the parties playing in these systems? Well, as a fellow resident of Illinois, I think you're spot on with your uh, take. Um, that, that's a tough question. I mean, I, I, I'm not a party scholar, and, and I think th there is some debate among political scientists about how we should interpret parties. But I think the role of the party is, uh, at the, and when we talk to uh, the party leaders, particularly in the assembly, they are looking in Arizona at you know, clean elections as uh, a recruitment tool so that you can go and you know you can fill out the uh, the seats where maybe no one would emerge to, to run to take on the incumbent who won with 68 percent last time and it's just a way you know they're seeing it not not as we're gonna win this seat but we're gonna put out a full slate of candidates because a rising tide you know lifts all boats so that in my experience has been how the parties are, are you know, kind of working with public funding I'm not going to say that it's diminishing their strength. I don't think that's true, but I would actually be really interested to hear what Spencer and Michael think about the small donor matching programs and the role of parties in those. Okay. Um, I, I think it's important that we increase incentives for political actors, candidates, parties, PACs, to reach out to average Americans and ask more people and engage more people in a, in a serious way. I also think that I am a fan of public financing. I think it's an appropriately, an entirely productive use of government funds. But I also think strategically we need some insurance policy so that when politicians in the future balance budgets and cut public financing money, we have other incentives to ensure actors will, political actors will reach out, not just to large contributors, but to average Americans. As a result, uh, I think that, you know, uh, one idea that was brought to my attention by Michael 
was the concept of uh, allowing parties uh, to spend more money on coordinated expenditures with candidates when that money comes from small donors, or you could do the first $200 of any contribution. That's one thing. Another uh, idea that happens in Colorado is a small donor pack, where a small donor pack collects a smaller amount from individuals, uh, average folks, but then it can give a larger amount to candidates than a conventional pack can. So giving these political actors incentives to ask and engage and bring more people into the process, I think, are key. Now that doesn't deal with this underlying issue, and I'll let Michael deal with that, of um, matching uh, programs and parties. Thanks for tossing <laughs> that ball. Um, I was going to start by saying I agree with uh, Spencer that um, we, we want to encourage activity and not discourage activity. Um, one, one problem with the way the issue was sometimes debated and Meredith's phrasing of the question was a fair reflection of, of the way it's debated, but, but you stated it with skepticism. But, and that is, we often hear political party used as if it means the same thing in all places. Um, clearly it does not. Uh, a party in a strong speaker state with strong caucuses, where the party carries the votes of the followers in his or her hip pocket, um, that's very different from a state where power is more dispersed and, the, and the, the role of the party in raising money and so forth is, is, is different. It's a, very, it's a very large question. Um, in, in general, I think we don't, one doesn't want to see um, the rules making it difficult or impossible for parties to work. Uh, under Supreme Court rulings, parties have the right to make unlimited independent expenditures. Um, something that has the label of party uh, can become a vehicle for making unlimited contributions that are intended to benefit the candidate. Um, and if you are in one of the 38 states that have contribution limits or the federal level where there are contribution limits on candidates, contribution limits on parties seems to be a necessary corollary. If you want the contribution limits to candidates to mean anything, um, some people in some states don't want them to mean anything and they behave that way. So you can't answer Meredith's question in a short time, but it's a really important question and it's the center of a lot of policy debates and I think the issue is too often romanticized. Uh, briefly again, anecdotally here, um, I've, seen, I've seen actually the recruitment concept definitely on the dem in the Democratic Party within Arizona. Um, encouraging candidates to run, um, which in some cases when you have such, um, so even though we have independent redistricting in the state of Arizona, which is, was, has been there for, since 92, I believe, um, you know, we do still have quite a lot of lopsided majority districts either on Republican or Democratic side. So we are able to, um, the party is able to get uh, to get candidates to challenge incumbents even though they may not have a very high chance of necessarily um, winning to at least engage that the, the people of that district in a discussion in discourse. So that's that's a good thing. I've also heard um, it, it also does would pull money, right? If, you, if you're a challenged incumbent, you're going to start working the district a little bit more. You're going to pay more attention to people in the district as well. Um, but then from my own particular situation, um, it, I, I became really by virtue of the public financing system of interest to the Democratic Party. So th that is how I would kind of twist that a little bit. I was, it, the party didn't find me. Even when I stumbled into the Democratic Party headquarters and presented myself awkwardly, they were still very kind of, they weren't quite sure about me. They didn't know who, what that was about. And they didn't really seem very interested in exploring uh, that. So um, I would say that, that it can help, definitely help them with recruitment, uh, though not necessarily in my case.
Hi, uh, Lee Drutman, Sunlight Foundation. So I'm going to ask a question that is in some ways an extension of the excellent question that Jonathan asked, which is what happens in the actual course of governing, right? This conversation was a lot about campaigning, almost nothing about governing, a lot about politics, nothing about policy. I heard Spencer mention the word accountable one time. Um, so the hypothesis, and I actually, I mean, I, th I think actually the evidence tends to support this about public funding, is one, you get better and more diverse candidates who are more representative of the population as a whole, and two, you get candidates who are spending more time listening and talking to actual voters as opposed to people who fund campaigns. Therefore, you'd think that the people who are in office are, are more in touch with the general concerns of the populace at large. So what happens? You have these matching funds or some, some system in which you bring more people into the system. And then when you have the two years of the legislative session, that goes away. So you have people who are new to, to, to legislating and maybe voters who have gotten involved. And then there's nothing to support their participation through that two years. So one hypothesis, my contention, is that what happens, that all goes away and then you're left with this permanent class of lobbyists and special interests to help part-time legislators do what the lobbyists and special interests want them to do. So I guess my question is, are there insights from public funding that we can take to actual lawmaking? And, and should we be thinking more about the two years of governing in, in, as a as a complement to the, the public funding. You know, we, there are only three states with full public funding, and some of the experts are in the room, all right? Um, but one, um, one has an impression but there have been no political science studies that look at this comprehensively. That the lobbyists simply do not set the agenda as much in Hartford as they used to. I can't speak about Arizona, um, and Maine is just a different place. New York City is different. You're not, you're not going far away. You're a subway ride from the legislative hall, um, and you live in your neighborhood. So this, this varies by place, um, but uh, one of the mechanisms that lobbyists use uh, to help control the agenda is not there. Uh, now, you have an hypothesis, I have an hypothesis. Uh, we both have the tools to do the testing but we'll acknowledge that uh, nobody's really done it in a systematic way. Uh, and let me just talk about uh, values and norms, right? I think there's this traditional reformer notion of a trustee civic republican notion of government where we want to free legislators from kind of private interests. They're going to operate using their best judgment as trustees. Uh, I have a healthy skepticism of that vision of democracy. I uh, would agree that over the course of a legislative cycle, we want uh, legislators to be accountable to citizens, not just lobbyists or a small group, but a broad and diverse group of people. And so just as a normative matter, for me, that's one of the reasons that a multiple match is more attractive than a direct grant. And I understand there's some connection to citizens in the sense that you have to, uh, you know, get uh, 200 or 250 qualifying contributions. But the movement of public financing uh, toward a more kind of accountable, diverse group that's over a legislative cycle or over a significant period of time, I, I think that's a, a, a good thing from a, a democratic value standpoint. Yeah, I would, sorry, oh, go ahead. Okay, um, so I had a professor in grad school who also was a professor that Michael had in grad school. We used to say that uh, government is born of the cold smoke of elections, you know. And so you know, thinking about these two kinds of systems that we've been talking about, um, if you believe that, you know, uh, Dr. Hines, like as he said, I could assess the 
the, the condition of the people that, that, that lived in my district. I think that bodes well for representation. If more of that is happening, um, if you believe that more of that is happening in the fully funded systems, I think you're going at least in a place where you can say there's evidence, preliminary evidence to, to think that that might be the case. But again, we don't, we don't know. All we have is a hypothesis. I do agree, though, that um, the small donor match programs are, appear to be very effective. Michael's got a very nice paper that suggests that the donor pool you know, looks a lot more like the voting pool in, the, in these systems, and I think they're very promising in, in that regard. And so you, by merging the campaigning and the fundraising elements you know, into one, um, I think uh, you're, you're also getting that out of these systems as well. So I think both points are correct. Uh, go, going s slightly tangential, forgive me, but as having been in a legislature where we have four term limits in place, that t to me, um, more than anything else, is what uh, empowers lobbyists and empowers appointed, hired members of the staff. And I could observe this because every two years between 30, actually between 40 and sometimes 50 percent of the Arizona legislature is new every two years. Um, and so the people that have the power, the people that literally write the bills and bring them to us, and well, not me as a member of the Democratic Party so much, but uh, sometimes, <laughs> but mostly to the majority, to the speaker, to the president's office, um, those are the lobbyists that have been there for 30, 20, 30 years. And I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing, but what I'm saying is, in my direct experience, that is what limited, more than anything else, the ability of legislators to, I think, most faithfully represent their constituencies because they didn't know what they were doing. You know, we're, we're trying to figure out where the bathrooms are, right? And, and there's always 40% of the legislature that doesn't know where the bathroom on the third floor is because they're new. And so what you have is, in this craziness, everything's new and different, you have lobbyists and you have, um, what, when you're not quite sure if you should be trusting that lobbyist or not, then uh, well, ask the chief of staff who's been there for 22 years. So, and I, that's probably a good thing too, but the chief of staff is not elected and neither are your, your legislative council lawyers, right? So those people don't have to go door to door and ask the voters for anything at all. And so that, that is what really, I know that's not directly the topic of this panel, but, but term limits is what seemed to have much more impact as far as I could tell. Lee, I want to, I'm going to step out of the role of moderator for a second to, to, because nobody else has to actually kind of endorse the, art, the point you were making because I think it's, I think it's it, it, it really reminds me of an article I just read recently by Heather Gerken um, uh, from Yale Law School, which I think the title of it is Lobbying as the New Campaign Finance Reform. And she's basically arguing that because the, the, the people who have the capacity to lobby are so limited, um, we, could, we could think about some lessons that come from public financing for how to build that, build that information capacity for lawmakers in a broader way. And that could come from mo things modeled on a small donor financing system that actually help smaller, help ordinary citizens get their voices heard in a legislature, or just uh, something more analogous to a full public financing system, which would be to create more centralized information resources. And I think, I think it's a really smart direction um, that, that she's laid out. And I, I, I recommend that that article, which is probably on your mind. It's, it's, it's an excellent article. Yeah. Uh, Shannon Brownlee. Hi, I'm Shannon Brownlee. I'm at the Lounge, which is a which is a nonprofit based in Boston. Oh, sorry, it's a nonprofit based in Boston that's uh, working on healthcare reform. And uh, let me give you a little bit of background for my question. Um, we're interested in promoting um, public del deliberation around healthcare reform and health promotion. So I'm wondering whether or not this small donor model um, increases civic engagement, not just at the voting booth, but also in people having conversations in their communities about what they want and how to get it. And does it actually increase um, people's ability to affect um, legislation? Both, so is it the conversation in the community and the legislation? Yeah. <coughs> Getting engaged in, in a campaign in a low-cost way increases your civic knowledge, which makes it easier to participate the next time around. So you increase social capital 
political capital. And that's a plus in the direction you're talking about. But deliberation, <laughs> public deliberation, requires uh, enabling structure. It doesn't happen by itself. Um, so it's a, st it's a step to create a tool. It's, it's useful, um, but not sufficient. Uh, and whether a candidate does town halls, whether a candidate encourages this, whether the candidate uses it for deliberation as opposed to using it as a selling vehicle, um, that's, uh, those are all possibilities. Uh, but you don't move directly from, from one to another. What you do get out of the small donor um, is you, uh, model is you've broken through uh, the one really important hurdle, which is to get the person engaged and to get the person who is potentially in power to ask the person to be engaged. Uh, just Sorry, yeah, again, door to door. That that's that's where you know where all those voter contacts occurred. And I know of, uh, I'm actually from one year to the next. I I, I had uh, there are a variety of legislative candidates running around the same district, talking to the same people, and those relationships really mean something. I know that there are many situations in which, um, if a voter had given five dollars to me. Then they would like, they would refuse to give it to any. They get very you know protective of of you because you have that bond. You have so you, you definitely are stimulating that kind of um, that that sort of civic engagement, and then uh, that can I believe go on to do other things. And at, at the very least, you're teaching them about all the different levels of government, what your legislators do or su are supposed to do, and um, and getting folks that maybe would only typically vote in a presidential year or for the president or a U.S. senator or governor. You're getting them uh, like, oh, no, no, that doctor guy came to my house. He's down here somewhere. And what's this? Oh, wow, judges. Um, maybe, hmm. you know, so they can, they, no, one, no one votes for judges. We all know that. Um, but um, I'm kidding. Uh, but, but uh, yeah, I, I do think that, that I have no way to measure it, but I do think that it, it, in my own experience, I, I could see that. I want to piggyback on this, even though I've already spoken much on this. Um, about one of the important differences between the clean election model and the matching fund model. Most people are most willing to be engaged. That is, they know the most that when you get close to election day. And what the clean election model does is it gets you to give $5 before most people have even heard of the candidate. It's strictly door to door. Um, and then it, it shuts off. Um, and the candidate does have to engage directly, but doesn't have this lever, this vehicle. So that's why most of the people who uh, supported full clean election funding and some are in this room are now looking at uh, hybrid models where you can continue the small donor fundraising up through election day as a way of getting people into the system. David Donnelly, I see you back there, and you were mentioned by name. And you want to you want to comment on that question? I'm, I'm actually just I'm drinking it all in. Okay, terrific. <laughs> but I did see a hand. I saw somebody. Yes. Hi, uh, Kurt Walters with Public Campaign Action Fund. I was really interested, Professor Miller, by your emphasis on roll off as opposed to turnout overall. So. Just wanted to know if such a system was to be in place at, say, the federal level, so House and Senate elections, do you think we might see a similar increase, maybe since they're at the top of the ballot, in overall turnout uh, rates? I think so. Um, for me, it was a, it was a well, yes, possibly. <laughs> so so I'm, I'm already walking that back. Um, I think my distinction in the book is merely theoretical uh, just because of you know as I said in the in the presentation I just it's really hard for me to get to a place where I believe that's the race you care about that's the reason why you're gonna go and vote is state legislature no offense Dr. Himes uh, but I, I think people are really focused on the, the federal races as voters that's the reason that they're that they're going there um, now 
does a, you know, if, if a publicly funded candidate you know, is running for Congress, does that make you more likely to vote? I'm not sure. I'm not sure that my findings are going to translate to federal races. And the reason for that is because most congressional races, and certainly the presidential race and Senate races, are already pretty visible. Right? So where are you going to uh, affect voter education and salience? It's going to be very marginal, I, I, I think. And so I'm not sure, and others may have different thoughts, but I'm not sure, the more I think about it, that we should expect higher turnout from public funding because um, particularly uh, since the proposed programs you know, are going to be the six to one match and we're still going to have fundraising and there's no reason necessarily to believe that congressional candidates would totally do it in this face-to-face -face way. Uh, I'm not sure that we would see those effects. And I think, I really do think though that we should give up turnout as a, the thing that we all want to see effects in. Uh, I, I would just note that I think that corruption and the appearance of corruption are important values and could be affected in especially congressional elections. Many of us have an idea that the presidency is, you know, what we think of when we think of politics. And I think that that's just not the case because there are so many other political actors and there's not as much transparency because there's not as much media coverage, right? And then also in terms of the presidency, you're raising money from so many more people that a large contribution that's $35,000 even isn't as significant. Whereas if you're running for Congress or you're running for state house or city council, a big contribution is important and you, there's not the leverage to attract those large contributions because you don't have the celebrity that's not as pl at play. So I think that these other candidates are more susceptible, have to do more to raise money and are more vulnerable. And I, I think that, you know, even though I personally believe that there are values other than preventing corruption that are important, I think that preventing corruption is key, right, especially with the Supreme Court, and a multiple matching system can, you know, help, help prevent corruption, especially at these lower level offices, including uh, House, U.S. House. Great, thanks. I know we have, we have to wrap up at 11 because there's another event coming up in this room. Michael, do you want to, any last words? I, I meant this, Michael. <laughs> I just want to thank everybody yeah. for coming out. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, likewise. Thank you all for, I really want to thank all our panelists, really. Uh, hey, great, great. Good job. Thank you very much.